this great nation will endure as it has endured. We will find and we will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. As Franklin D. Roosevelt spoke these simple and inspiring words in 1933, Americans from coast to coast, weary from years of economic hardship, were willing to take the freshly minted president at his word. He offered them hope, which was all that many people had left. The economic hardships brought on by the Great Depression had reached a pinnacle by the spring of 1933. On March 4th, an unprecedented event had occurred. Each and every bank had closed its doors. For some this measure was only temporary, but for a large number the economic crisis was a permanent reality. The banking system was near collapse, a quarter of the labor force was unemployed, and prices and production were down by a third from their 1929 levels. During his first inaugural speech, President Roosevelt looked over the tense crowd in front of the Capitol, anxiously gathered before him, and with unquestionable conviction stated, This nation asks for action, and action now. My father was a cotton mill worker, and so we moved a lot. <laughs> I, by the time I was 21 years old, I had moved 21 times. But we, you know, we didn't have a big house back then, and you didn't have a carpet or anything like that. You had the linoleum floor, uh, wooden floors with linoleum rugs down on top of it to keep the air out, because uh, some of the places we lived, you could see the ground through the floor. Uh, we ran a country grocery store. We ran a grist mill and a cotton gin in the south. Cotton was the king, and you couldn't get anything for the cotton. And then the government came along and had us take and uh, cut out cotton production. Back in the Depression, uh, we saw a lot of people come from southeast Kentucky and eastern Tennessee because they wanted to get better jobs. There was nothing going in the coal mines. And so we had a lot of people come in that uh, were in bad shape. And they also went across the river to Cincinnati, and there were almost uh, little enclaves of them, those people, hoping they'd get someday up to Detroit. People found ways to get money, to do a job, to get employment, to keep the family going. In the first 100 days of the new administration, 15 measures flowed from the White House to Congress. 15 new laws assured absolute government action to employ the jobless, to improve the Tennessee Valley, to support crop prices, to prevent home foreclosures, to ensure bank deposits, and to stabilize the economy. Franklin D. Roosevelt called these programs a new deal for the nation. My mother got a job with the WPA, one of the New Deal agencies. She worked in the public library, and I think she really enjoyed that job. She talked about it a lot, and it's the only job that she ever had in her entire life. Later on, after she married, she did not work outside the home, and, uh, but she talked a lot. When she would take us to the library as small children, she would tell us about her experiences working for the WPA in the public library. During the Depression, many people from Oklahoma and other states affected by the Dust Bowl moved to San Joaquin Valley looking for work. Some families were lucky and were able to get good jobs in Tehachapi, working in the cement plant and the Woman's State Prison. My parents bought a house on the edge of town and we had no gas or sewer line. I can still remember when the gas line was laid through the alley, the workers wrapping the material that looked like saran wrap around the pipes. The house next door was rented mostly by families from Oklahoma. One family built a small square shack behind the house using rolls of roofing material 
to cover the outside walls, and migrant families would live in the shack for a while before moving somewhere else looking for work. Our house was close to the railroad tracks, and I remember men knocking on our back door asking for water and something to eat. My mom would make them a bologna sandwich and white bread. Back then, these men were not called homeless people, but were called hobos or tramps that rode the trains. A lot of people remember what things cost, but they don't remember what they made. And that makes a whole lot of difference. You know, you could buy a Coke for a nickel or a hamburger for a nickel, but the trouble was you didn't have a nickel uh, to buy them with mostly. And just things like that. So, you know, your memory clouds things a little bit, and uh, you tend to remember the good thing. My husband, um, when he was a small boy, he was brought up in Walker County, Alabama. It is a coal mining district. And um, he was paid 10 cents a shot to go into the coal mines and to light the fuse on the blasting powder and then run like blazes to get out before the thing exploded. And men wouldn't do it, grown men wouldn't do it because they couldn't move fast enough. So they hired him because he was small and wiry and he just, he would get out of there before it blew up. Well, when his father found out about it, he whooped the tar out of him. <laughs> The President's first priority was relief for the millions of Americans who suddenly found themselves without work, without food, without shelter, and without hope. He concluded that help for the downtrodden must come from beyond the traditional private or local government sources. He believed that the federal government needed to take on a larger role in providing for the well-being of the American people. Of his many initiatives, the Works Progress Administration was the largest. It was created in the spring of 1935, and it further extended the national relief effort. The primary goal of the WPA was to alleviate the high unemployment rate and to provide assistance for the discouraged American workforce. The benefits from working for the WPA was that he was given fabric. And my mother has told me several times of this, a story of where they got the fabric and it seems that the fabric was all one color and one design. So everybody knew if you had that fabric that it was a WPA type uh, part of their job, part of their pay. My grandmother made dresses for all the girls and my mother was really excited because that meant she had two dresses. And um, in this day and time we don't think of that many, but uh, she was very excited about wearing her new dress to School, but when she got there, the other girls who had a little bit more money uh, kind of laughed at her because she had on WPA. But I laughed at her at her statement. She said, I didn't care. I had another dress and said that was the most important thing. Uh, my uh, grandmother was a seamstress and she worked all of her life, all of her married life, and um, she would send this aunt out to uh, collect remnants from uh, clothing factories and so um, clothes was not a problem. It was not an issue because my grandmother could make something out of nothing always. She said however shoes, they didn't have shoes because grandma couldn't make shoes. <laughs> One of my aunts who was 85 shared so many stories with me. She said that she didn't feel that the depression had made that much of an impact on them because they were a family of nine children so life was just always a struggle and uh, she didn't really notice that much because uh, everybody in the neighborhood and all the other family members were working just as hard and struggling just as hard. One of the stories that my mother tells is that the rolling truck would come to their farm once a week and if they had worked hard for their family that week, they got one egg. Each child, there was 12 children, they got one egg and when the truck came, they could trade that egg for a piece of candy. And my mother tells to this day how good that candy tasted because that was the only candy they got for another whole week. When we were little, we had to go out near the dump and play ball. You know, use rocks and, and stones for Basis. My brother and I, one of the things that we loved to do all the time 
uh, in the summertime was to go and pick blackberries. Blackberries are plentiful and they're free. They grow wild in the woods and we would always uh, come home and I would help her make a pie, blackberry pie. And we loved it and she would always tell me that uh, we were using her, grand her mother's recipe and blackberry pie is a very simple dish to make. It doesn't cost very much if the blackberries are free. Uh, it's just a little sugar and then a little crust made with flour and lard. And uh, she would tell me that there were times during the Depression when blackberry pie is all that they had to eat. Raised in the Sunset District of San Francisco, my dad had an office job and like so many people in the prosperous 1920s, he was doing well. Then the Great Depression hit. My dad lost his job in 1930. His savings were depleted, we were forced to accept charity. The term welfare was not in vogue at the time. The procedure was once a week the Associated Charities of San Francisco would deliver boxes of food to needy families. We would watch as the boxes were brought to the men. At first one or two families were getting aid, but as the depression deepened most of the families were receiving assistance. It was sad to see men selling apples on the street corners. Their clothes were old and shabby and usually consisted of a pair of old pants with a suit coat trying to stay warm on a typical foggy day. We lost our house, a cottage at 1933 8th Avenue, which still stands and is presently occupied. Edward McSweeney, June 1994. My grandfather used to talk a whole lot about the Depression, and he often stated that uh, during the Depression that money was real tight. And I remember a story he told me about his oldest son. He said, uh, if you do it right, living on the farm, you could always eat. And he said he didn't have to stand in the soup line, anything like that, because he was able to raise his own food. And also, uh, he had plenty of cows and uh, chickens and hogs for food. So he wasn't hungry, but some of the other things like clothing, his family didn't have many clothes or anything like that. They didn't have much money to buy them. And he stated that his son was barefooted and uh, he wanted him to go to school and he didn't have shoes. And he found the nickel and with that nickel he went and bought his son a pair of shoes. My grandmother, she stated that she was mad at uh, President Hoover at the time. And uh, she felt at that particular time that the work she had to do wasn't much better than the work that uh, her grandparents had to do and you know they were slaves and she said that wasn't much better than slave labor.